Thank you, Dad. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really excited for what's about to happen because it's been talked about for a little bit and it's been a little serendipitous of how it all came to be. So I'm going to do a very short traditional introduction of who Toby is and who Jay is so that you know who's about to speak here. Uh, but I think most of you know Toby, but I will do that. And then I'll go into how I met them, which is kind of how this all came about. So um, as I said, most of you know Toby, and to go through the list of accomplishments would take too long. Um, he has successfully managed three over $1 billion businesses, two successful IPOs, raised over $300 million in private and public financing, was the president of Solar City, now Tesla, uh, and, and, and more, I'm not gonna keep going, but just to say we have a credible person here um, who has a lot of success but has a ton of passion around what we're talking about tonight. Um, and what I think is cool about Toby, there's a lot of things, but I will say that uh, when we were talking, Jay and Toby and I got together for coffee before this, and one of the things he was talking about was how he, he mentioned how he was his natural passion was in technology in high school. And he was just lucky enough to be aligned with the sector that took off, that made great amounts of money. He didn't come from money, but he was, he's successful in something that he was naturally passionate about, but he recognized that it wasn't all him, that it was something about the fact that he's lucky to be in this time and have been passionate about something that took off at a time, as, as he said, that maybe 98% of the world didn't necessarily have their hand in. Um, and I think it's really awesome when people who are super successful recognize that it's, there's a little luck and a lot of um, alignment that comes with that. Um, and then Jay Nichols. Uh, Jay is, has been a friend of mine for a while. I'll go into that story later, but um, I couldn't even get Jay to send me his bio. That's, that's for an indicator of Jay to start with. Um, it's something that's, that's Jay. He is a true learner and he's a server and he's a scientist, um, to give some of his credentials, you know, he got his master's at Duke, he got his PhD at University of Arizona, and recently won their Global Achievement Award. He was on the board of directors at Save Our Shores, Turtle Island Restoration Network, Save the Waves Coalition, and many more. He's a research associate for California Academy of Sciences, founder of Ocean Revolution and Blue Mind Life, and his work has been published in many places and he's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Blue Mind, as we've heard, that is being sold right there at that table for $20, and he will sign it. Uh, and he's the creator of bluemarble.org. So that's the traditional introduction. Um, now I'm gonna say how I met these people. In 2008, I would go to the Octagon in Santa Cruz. I had um, been working in investment management for years and saw all these people with, and dealt with lots of money and didn't see a lot of happiness. And then I became a morning show host on the radio and saw people in fame, didn't see a lot of happiness. And then I took off for India and Bali and studying meditation yoga. And when I came back, I had been gone for about eight months. And when I came back, reintroduction into the US after being living somewhere like India is really rough on your system. Um, you see a lot, you recognize a lot about your life. And when I came back into the States, I very consciously came to Santa Cruz. My mom was living in the hair, and she still does. And I wanted to ease back in. Um, and there's something about Santa Cruz, which you all know. Um, so I started making my office the coffee shops. And I was going and trying to figure out, like I said, I'd seen money and I'd seen fame. And I was like, what am I going to do? What, is, what am I supposed to do? And I ended up sharing this office of the Octagon with Jay Nichols. And he was there daily working on this, you know, this passion of, of the ocean, of water, and we got to talking daily, and it literally felt like we shared an office. And Jay's story was really interesting to me because he has all these credentials, and he was being paid by big companies, big money, to go out, but they wanted him to give his message with a lot of caveats. Don't say the plastic's not good for the ocean. Don't, don't say us big oil companies are doing things that aren't good. And that just wasn't who he was. And his, he had this message that lived in him. And he needed to do it in a way that was pure. And he was trying to figure out how he could do his message and get it out there, which he will do a much better job sitting here to, to share. 
but it's a lot about what we're hearing today, the love for the ocean and the water and all of this science of it, but his is the science mixing with the people, the emotion, who you are, what you feel when you're with the ocean. And I was moved by this person who could make a lot of money in one way, but was more determined to do the message that he was here to do, just one of those people. So one day uh, in that coffee shop in 2008, he said to me, hey LeBaron, I see you recycle and you do things and you care about the water and the earth. I'm gonna give you this blue marble. I'm just doing that to recognize what you're doing. And I want you to take it and then I want, when you see somebody who's doing something good for the water and the ocean, I want you to pass it on, just as an awareness. And then he paused. I said, what do you think about that? <laughs> I said, I think that's cool. You do? I said, yeah, I think it's really cool. It's an awareness campaign. It's just awareness. And here I was every day in my computer and in my head, paralyzed, trying to figure out what to do. And he just had this very simple moment of awareness that could be passed on. I said, that's great. And kids and anybody can understand it. So that was the first blue marble. And I was lucky enough to receive it. It has now gone through. <laughs> Dalai Lama has one. All these people around the world have one. Um, and that was just a simple concept. And it was, it's inspiring to watch that because sometimes we do get paralyzed and thinking we have to do something big. And he did something small that raises people aware, people's awareness about something important. So that's how I met Jay. Now, Fast forward to 2016 December, as Doug said, I was eight months pregnant and we moved here, my husband and I moved here to have our daughter here in Santa Cruz. We wanted to be near my mom and we wanted to be near the ocean and we wanted to be here specifically. So we had just gotten into town and my mom's friends were having people over, about 10 of us. Well, Toby and his wife were there and we're chatting and I had heard who Toby was. Toby's got a reputation. I knew he was, but I wouldn't have known that by the room. He was beaming about some trip in Bali and the surfing in the ocean, and then he says something about, oh, this book blew mind. I said, oh, I know the guy who wrote that. And he said, you do? I said, yeah, he gave me the first blue marble. And then somebody else says, he gave you the first blue marble? She says, oh, I have a blue marble. I said, who'd you get that from? He said, I got, should I get it from your cousin Sasha years ago? In fact, let me go get it. I said, that's funny. Because the first blue marble I ever got, I gave to my cousin Sasha. So eight years later, the first blue marble comes back to me. And with that, I'm going to wrap it up quickly just to say that um, Toby, I was like, God, this guy has such a passion for this, and he doesn't know Jay. And Doug had been this great introducer for us of all these people, and he didn't know Jay. And we met Carrie Waters and Hillary, and we were looking at what Bowie's doing. I'm like, how do these people, he's right here. Everyone has been so gracious to us in moving into this community. Let's put together a dinner where we bring together these people who care about the same thing and introduce them to Jay. So Jay has this gorgeous home and on the slowcoast.org. If you're ever looking, he rents it out and it's beautiful. And it's a cabin out in the woods. And he had us all over. And my husband, Mark, and I uh, hosted this dinner to introduce all these people who care about the same thing. And so that's why I'm so thrilled about tonight. Because at that dinner, which was about a month and a half ago, we talked about this happening. And Doug made it happen. But all of you showed up to prove that we should be doing this, which is awesome. So thank you. And I will end with one thing before bringing up our two featured people today. And that is, um, there's so much tonight about um, all the different ways that people are doing things and, and how you can help. And I know, like Doug said, Mark and I show up every month because it's cool and inspiring to see what's happening in this community. But sometimes we get inspired in the moment and we go back to our lives. Um, and I just, I want to really encourage tonight that if you are moved by what Jay is doing, I just really encourage you to do a one of a few things. One is change the conversation around water and he will talk about that better than anyone can. It's not just about the microorganisms and how this and the science of it, and that's super important because we need to live off of this. The person you just spoke beautifully about, right? But you had an amazing statistic, over $19 billion is around recreation and tourism. That's because people need to be near the water. And that's what Jay talks about. And no one does it better than Jay. But Jay is funding Jay in doing it. And I wanna put out there that we're gonna put up his website. It's Patreon, 
dot com backslash Wallace J Nichols. And if you are interested in supporting what he is doing, it can be a dollar a month, it can be whatever, but you get, you become part of the conversation, you become part of the solution, and you see what he is doing, um, and, and you do something. You don't just get inspired and go home, you do something. Or you just change the conversation around water, and you talk about how important it is to be near it, and to take care of it, because it makes us better people, and healthier, happier people. Um, and with that, I think I've taken up probably more time than I was allotted. So I would love to welcome to the stage, Toby Corey and Jay Nichols. I'm going, I should give Jay the blue mic, huh? Should I give Jay the blue mic? We'll switch, we'll switch off halfway through. No. No. The blue, can you hear the blue mic though? Is that, okay. Of course, of course I can, let me yell? All right, I guess we should. Is it on? Yeah, it turned the red mic on. No, the sun's off. Oh. Sun's off. Sun block. There you go. All right, awesome, cool. So, let me open up with a couple things. Um, it's gonna be a really interesting talk tonight. I'm so humbled and honored to be here. LeBaron, and what you said was just so extraordinary. Living here is amazing. But so two things. Where's, where's John D from Santa Cruz Sentinel? So last time I spoke here was in December. Um, I committed to do a one-year stand at Tesla, run their energy stuff, get Solar City integrated, work 70 hours a week. And she quoted me on a really great quote, which was, uh, "Startups are hard." And I want to like revise that a little bit. Life's hard. Life's really hard. Um, we're in a very interesting time without going through the nauseating details of the current administration and climate change and nuclear proliferation and the list sort of goes on and on. So this is kind of going to be a philosophical conversation tonight with uh, an individual that um, is amazing, Dr. Nichols. And I'm going to share uh, my brief story with you on how we even met. I don't know if it's irony or the cosmos or how all this happened. Um, I've had my entire life this amazing connection with water, particularly the ocean. Um, short story, when I was uh, 10 years old, 1972, we did, I grew up in Connecticut, did a cross-country trip, um, ended up in waking up um, in the morning in 1972 in Arizona on a bluff looking at the Pacific Ocean and telling my mom, someday I'm going to move to California. And it was California, Pacific Ocean, just pure water and ocean that literally <clears throat> captured my imagination and was a set point for one of my lives. It just changed my life in the most fundamental way. And I always wondered like, why do I love the water so much? My dad was awesome. He was always into the environment. We did a lot of fishing, lake fishing for trout. Um, he finally got a bigger boat. We used to go down to the water and fish for blue fish and um, in the ocean and I, as much as I love the water, the ocean just did the most amazing thing for me my entire life. And I always wondered, why am I so attracted to the water? Why do I love the ocean? Why do I have to be near it? Why do I have to be on it? Like, why is that? And it puzzled me for years and years. And over a year ago, um, I don't know if I was in Pescadero or where I was, um, and I happened to stumble upon this book called The Blue Mind. And I hadn't even met Dr. Nichols. And I picked it up and I read it. And I, I try and read as much as I can. And it was an amazing book. Um, it changed my life. It explained so much to me. Why I want to be here. Why I love this community. Why I love everyone in this room. Why I love Doug Erickson. Um, but it was just unbelievable, which was like, why? Is it? So it was the most amazing read ever. And um, his insights are awesome. He's going to share that with you tonight. But before I get started, I talked about how life is hard. So I want to just get everyone in the right frame of mind for this discussion. And I'd like to ask everyone for a moment to please close your eyes. And I want you to take three breaths in and let it out. Feel it really come in and let it out. And everything you're worrying about, leave it behind. Relax your entire body. And then I want you to picture you're walking on your most favorite California beach and you hear the water, 
hear the ocean, you feel that energy. As you're walking down that beach, you feel the sand at the bottom of your feet. And as the water and these waves roll into your ankles and into your shins and into your body, feel this new energy come in. And when that water recedes, feel all of your problems and all of your issues recede. Just stay there for a moment. When you're ready, open up your eyes. And that feeling that you have right now is how I felt when I finished reading Jay's book. So with that, he's the celebrity, he's the star here. Tell me what Blue Mind is all about. So I just want to take that, this blissful moment that you're in and, and draw your attention to Toby's shoes. Because <laughs> they are, hold that, look at that thing. I've never seen shoes quite that beautiful. <laughs> I mean, I can, can look you, at can those shoes. Can you wear your sandals and wear one of my... Yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, that's, can I have one? Yeah. All right. All right, wrong All right, one. Wrong one. one. Sorry. Yeah, there you go. All right. All right. So this is, we did not plan this shoe swap uh, in the three meetings that led up to this conversation. All right, look at that. Like, seriously. Look at these, so imagine yourself walking through any city street wearing these shoes and you, you feel a little stressed and you just look down and you remember, I'm from Santa Cruz. I feel okay. Right? Life is going gonna, it's gonna to be okay because I can always go back to the water. And that... You know, that's the feel. that's why we're here, that's, I mean, Dr. Griggs, Gary, it, you know, we're, we're ocean scientists because we fell in love with the water at some point, and you couldn't stop us, period. We just went for it, and this man has taught for 50 years here in our community, and you can't even imagine how many minds and souls and hearts he's transformed uh, that have gone and, and done amazing things, but that what hooks us is something besides, you know, we, we heard about the ecological aspects of Monterey Bay, the economic, vast economic component of a healthy ocean, and then the educational value. But what's missing from our story has been the emotional connection. I went, I went to the 24th grade. I, I scare the crap out of my kids when I tell them that. Uh, there's a lot of grades, uh, grad school and then more grad school. And nobody ever taught me the science of emotion, not once. And that's, that is the one thing that has made my career, uh, has fueled my career. I love sea turtles, and I, I don't know why, but, you, but it's an unstoppable thing. And so I was very curious about the neuroscience, the neuropsychology behind our connection to, to the water. Your story, I, I want you to tell that entire story of seeing the ocean and saying, I'm coming there, I want to hear that over and over again because that is the quintessential Blue Mind story. And so I wondered, I wondered about that. I wondered if the neuroscientists who were studying music and they were studying uh, the, the, neuro, the neuroscience of stress, the neuroscience, you name it, if they had studied the neuroscience of our relationship with water, because they were doing everything else. And these, this, is, this is Stanford and Harvard and MIT and University of Exeter Medical School. Um, but they had it that was missing for some single biggest feature of our planet and they hadn't gotten around to it. And so then I tried to convince um, some neuroscientists that they should study it and write about it so that I could read their book and use it. <laughs> That's, that was my plan. I wasn't planning on writing a book. And I, I failed at that, that task. And Oliver Sacks, some of you may know the late great neurologist Oliver Sacks, who was a brilliant man. Uh, and a water lover. And I met him and I said, I have this idea for your next book. And he listened, because he was an avid swimmer, and he said, I get my best ideas from the water. And he had a lot of great ideas. And quite an intellect, powerhouse. And he listened to my pitch, and he said, that's a fine idea. And he, if, you, if you've heard Oliver Sacks speak, you can imagine his accent and his, the depth of his, his voice. He said, that's a fine idea. You do it. And of course I said, oh shit. <laughs> I think I have to do this. And so five years later, uh, got, got this book out. And, um, 
And it's you know, a beginning of the conversation of connecting the dots between the science of emotion, the neurophysiology, the neurochemistry, the neuropsychology, and not just the ocean, but lakes, rivers, pools, puddles, rainstorms, showers, bathtubs, um, not, not leaky ceilings though, <laughs> uh, and not, not hurricanes, by the way. So that's not good. how it happened. So um, begrudgingly, um, I feel that that's what scientists like to do. You identify uh, a gap and you fill it through inquiry and tenacity and asking and asking and trying and asking more and testing and, and that's, that's what this has been about. Um, I'm, I'm ill-equipped to be the, the messenger of the neuroscience of our relationship to water. I'm a sea turtle biologist, which uh, is my passion, but um, this has fallen in my lap. So uh, thanks for coming tonight and listening to the sea turtle biologist talk about uh, water in our brains. That's awesome. You talked about a sea turtle. So you and I and LeBaron had coffee this week at Captain Cloud. I'll give him a free plug. Did they pay? Did they not sponsor Doug? Can you get them? <laughs> Is there a coffee sponsor here? All right, uh, but in any event, you told an awesome story, um, and it was, I think, part of your vision, and part of your mission, and part of your inspiration about this turtle that traveled 7,000 miles. Yeah. That was such an awesome story. Share it with the group. So every once in a while, there's a looping slideshow that we're not even looking at. We're not looking at, you are. Uh, every once in a while, there's this, this turtle swimming that comes around, followed by a track. Uh, in 1996, we put a satellite transmitter. So this is, this is kind of one of the rare moments where it's gonna get techy. Uh, and so, you know, Gary said, I'm the least te technically uh, adept person in the room. I'm, I'm gonna add a little technology to this. Um, we put a satellite transmitter in 1996 on the back of a loggerhead turtle that had been raised in captivity for 10 years. Uh, we, we released her on the Pacific coast of Baja in a little fishing village called Santa Rosalita so Baja fishing houses will know Santa Rosalia. This is different, this is the Pacific side, a little fishing village. Uh, 10 years in captivity in a small tank that's probably about, you know, round about from between, between Gary and I, that, that big, small tank. Um, she swims off and uh, Bob Snodgrass, who was at Scripps at the time, got some video of it, and that's the video. And she swims off and proceeds to swim home which is 7,000 miles away, other side of the Pacific Ocean. Nobody ever tracked, had ever tracked an animal of any kind swimming across an entire ocean before. So we didn't know that animals could cross the Pacific. There's something called the East Pacific Barrier that cons was considered a, a barrier to, you know, to not a lot of food out there. Um, this turtle swam right through that and headed home, 7,000 miles. And so we did, we did something that at the time was revolutionary, and you'll, you, you will laugh, this group especially. We put her data online in real time. It was considered scandalous in 1996. <laughs> uh, my colleagues said, people are gonna steal your data right? when you, if you share it online in real time. So I thought about it a little, and I thought, what would they do with stolen turtle data? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, and I thought, and I thought, the only thing I could think of was good. Maybe they, could, they could learn about turtles. <laughs> they could think turtles are cool. I didn't imagine that they could teach uh, poetry and algebra and inspire kids and just, that would just, we would be collaborating with uh, fellow scientists around the world, oceanographers and sea turtle biologists, and uh, so we tracked this turtle in real time across the ocean, breaking all kinds of rules by putting our data pre-publication online, again, 1996, on this thing called the internet, the internets, I guess you might <laughs> recall. And so we tracked this turtle, and, and the, the interesting thing, when the video comes around, you'll notice, as she's swimming away, she pauses, right where you would expect to have found that wall that, of the tank that she had been living in. She pauses, so there's a memory from 10 years of living in a tank, mm -hmm. as if to say, there should be a wall here and I would be slamming my head against the wall. And so the science of this turtle's migration is fascinating and we could spend the next week on that, but the metaphor is powerful. 
that, that, yeah. So yeah. watch this. This is so cool. Swim, swim, pause. Wall, where's the wall? No wall. I think I'll keep swimming to friggin' Japan right now. <laughs> 7,000 miles, 368 days and change across the North Pacific Ocean, the most vast stretch of wilderness our planet has to offer. Um, that pause is fascinating. That's the, the pause that we all, we all pause or stop because we imagine something that isn't there. You can probably relate to that in some way, shape, or form, but the, that's the, the cool story. And then, of course, she swims uh, almost straight, I and mean, that's a pretty darn straight line for a turtle to make across an ocean. Uh, just saying, I don't have a lot to compare it to, but if you were trying to do that, that's about one knot, constant one knot, no apparent stops or meandering, um, some currents bumping her around, so nobody had ever tracked an, any animal across the ocean. It sort of required some rewriting of some of the oceanographic textbooks. And here's the, the, the main thing I want to tell you. Last year, my daughter came home from school. And she's, she's 15. And if you have a 15-year-old daughter in particular, um, you know that that's about when you become the most uncool man on the planet. <laughs> she came home and she said, Dad, we did the PSAT exam and your, your turtle was on the reading comprehension essay <laughs> 20 years later. So I was cool for 15 seconds. Her friends thought I was cool for 15 seconds, and then it, it like, over. <laughs> 15 seconds. So that's really the whole, that's like the whole point of the story right there. <laughs> I have two daughters and I've never been cool, so 15 seconds is pretty awesome. Um, all right, I opened up my talk talking about um, revising my quote for the Santa Cruz Sentinel about startups are hard, life's harder. And um, there is a lot going on. I thought a lot hard about this, had some great philosophical discussions with Jay and LeBaron and Doug and Margie and a number of other people. Um, and they are really interesting times. Um, life does feel like it's accelerating. The pace of technology, how many emails, how many text messages, this app, that app. And um, I, with all the global issues that are going on, I talked a little bit about military conflict and nuclear threats and um, this massive problem of climate change and um, agriculture. Like the list just doesn't stop. And I do think there's help coming. I, I see an incredibly bright future, especially based here in Santa Cruz. But as we ponder all of that and all the demands and all the pressures and all the anxiety that we all have going forward, um, for me, water and Santa Cruz in particular and the ocean has been just an incredible release for that. But you talk about like what you study and the science behind that and like how, how can that relieve all of the issues that we're dealing with here in the 21st century? So the, the, the thing that we, when we talk about the value, let's just say the ocean for now because we're near the ocean, but it holds for lakes and rivers if they're healthy. When we talk about the value, we do focus on the economic, the ecological, and the educational, not the emotional. When you crack the code on the, the emotion and you get comfortable with the science, what you find is that going, going to the water, I think we can probably all agree, um, have you ever gone to the ocean to reduce your stress level? Yes. Whether you knew it or not, that ended up happening. Um, we all practice that. I, my wife will say, I think you need to go to the ocean. Uh, <laughs> and I know what that means. Actually, just, sometimes she doesn't even have to use words, and I know it. She, she that means it. stop being a dick, Jim. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, that one time that I was a dick. That, that. I get it all the time. <laughs> um, and I, and I, with, our, with our daughters now, they know they know to go to the ocean. They're having a crap day. Go, just go to the water. Uh, it, it, so in our community, imagine how many, let's just say, how many pounds of stress, if you could measure stress in pounds, has our ocean sucked out of our community? Like a gazillion pounds of stress, right? Now take all that stress out of the ocean and drop it right back in Santa Cruz. Not good, really bad. So we get more conflict, we get m less creativity, we get le less romance. <laughs> Um, so now we like, don't do that, take it back and throw it back in the ocean, the ocean can take it. So that's just one example. Um, 
there are countless, you know, uh, somewhat apocryphal examples, but I've actually tracked a few down and, and there are many real ones of entrepreneurs, scientists, creative people. Pharrell Williams says he got his creativity from the water. What is he talking about? Right? How do you get creativity from water? We know you just, you go there and you let it do that thing that it does. And that thing is blue mind. And that's, you, to understand blue mind, you first have to understand red mind, which is our overstimulated, overinformed, overconnected, mildly or extremely stressed out, normal lives. You know, you wake up, technology's in your face, and then the last thing you do before bed is you check it one more time and go dream about that crappy text message that you just got. Like, that's, norm that's normal life. It's breaking away, logging out, going to the water, and letting, letting your, your blue mind happen. Visually, auditorily, and somatically, it shifts us, right? It, it's a, that's what we're talking about. And that's studyable through the high-tech uh, procedures that we have available now. So brain, Im brain imaging, uh, we can measure oxygen and electricity in the brain through fMRIs, through EEGs, increasingly small, increasingly mobile, like everything, like, like the drone, right? Increasingly, um, the, the democratization of neuroscience research is underway. Smaller, more mobile units that you can wear while you're doing things. We can collect that information and study wellness, mental wellness. So that's, that's the context. And there is no better source of awe, wonder, I would argue romance, creativity, relaxation, peace, freedom. I mean, it sounds hippy-dippy, but when you start talking to neuroscientists who study the science of awe, it's super cool. Um, Paul Piff at UC Irvine studies the science of awe. Uh, I call him Dr. Awesome, and he likes it. So, <laughs> so look up Dr. Awesome, Paul Piff. Uh, the science of awe, that's cool. The science of happiness, the science of romance, and the neuroscience of play. So we, we all play, we go out and play in the water. We may not call it play, we may call it surfing, or we may call it some sort of sport, but it's play. And the neuroscience of play, uh, the necessity of play, all good companies know that you, you gotta let your people play, right? If you want creativity, you want performance, you want a, you want a thriving company, let people play. Uh, water's the best place to play. Um, balloons are fun, water balloons, are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're, we got to wrap this up, yeah. unfortunately. But look, um, first time I read Jay's book, obviously it moved me. I'm so honored and blessed to be here having this conversation with him and, and all of you tonight. And um, we'll, we'll figure out a way to continue this conversation, maybe some coffee club stuff. Um, LeBaron and I and Jay and Doug and get together. Maybe we'll figure out a way to extend this. There's so much more to talk about, um, so much more to share with you. Um, and uh, before we wrap it up, Jay's the most modest guy on the planet. He truly is, I, I don't think LeBaron could have said it any better. No corporate dollars, this and that. And uh, the best thing you can do is like, for $20 signed book, that's insane, awesome. Um, please help Jay out. His website on patronage, um, let's put that URL back up there and do that. And. Um, I also think as I, we're wearing these kind of blue shoes, in all honesty, then it's like, my desk isn't in the ocean. I'd love it if it were. If I could put my desk on my surfboard, it'd be the coolest fucking thing on the planet. But I haven't figured it out yet. So maybe Jay, like, why don't you come up with a blue mind shoe, dude? And like, and then proceeds could go to ocean development. So when you're not in the ocean, your feet aren't in there. You could look down and you got blue mind shoes on. So new concept that I work on. I want to work with you on that. Before we finish up, though. Uh, just real quickly, tell me about your mission in life and how we can all help you out. I, you know, the, in the context of, of tonight, the, my, my mission is to change the conversation about water for good. Uh, we have undervalued our wild waterways, our oceans, our lakes, and our rivers. And when you undervalue anything or anyone, bad shit happens. And it's happening. We, you know, I mean, Gary put up that list, and we could dial into each of those those bullets deeply, and it's front page news daily. Um, I think 
a contribution to this effort would be to, to really understand that from, from when we're born to when we die, our lakes, rivers, and oceans, and wild waterways uh, make our lives better, make our lives worth living. Um, it's where we go to grieve when we lose our loved ones. It's, it's where we go to memorialize those we cared about. It's where we go to baptize uh, new life. It's, some people do water births. And throughout our lives, it's where we play. It's where we thrive. It's where we hit our reset button. And I'm talking about the Great Lakes and all the great rivers and the big oceans. And that's been missing. I didn't learn that in any of my 24 grades. None, none of that. Uh, it came later. We need to dial that in. Um, and Santa Cruz has a long tradition of kick-ass, world-changing ideas. There's a reason for that, because we are near the water, which helps us be more empathetic, more creative, I think, more fearless, and, and then the ideas spread. So this is where Blue Mind is coming from. This is Blue Mind Central. And the, you know, the, book, the book is a vehicle, but it's been translated to six languages so far. We're trying to get it out further. Um, if you don't read, there are you know, magazine articles and short videos, and there are many ways to interpret this science and make it accessible. So that, that's my mission, is to, to change our understanding of water. I want every kid that comes to the, our tide pools, not just to learn what a limpet is and who eats a limpet and what a limpet eat, eat, but they need to learn that they can come to that tide pool anytime during their life and they'll feel better. It's their tide pool. And they can, they can be 85 years old with their sweetie and come there and it'll make, make the day. Or they can come there when they have writer's block or musician's block or a scientist block. Um, we don't teach kids that. And that's what makes me so excited about Blue Futures. That bringing, dialing that in, um, that's the low hanging fruit. So I could, I could go on, I wanna stop. But that's, that's the idea here. And it, um, it's, it's a big ancient idea that has new technology and new science behind it. And I think now's the time, really, yeah. truly. So for those that want to continue the Blue Mind conversation, leave your email address with Jay or I. This is just a starting point. It's going to go on from here. And uh, what an honor and privilege. Please give Jay the most amazing welcome. <laughs> All right. Um, God. Um, next up, all.